alone. So sing it out this morning as we praise the Lord and sing these truths.
Praise the Lord. Yeah, let's give them a round of applause. Christy, thank you for singing such a beautiful song. And then, ladies, you did such a wonderful, wonderful job. Take out your worship guide. We'll notice a few announcements here this morning. And I want to thank you for uh, being here. And uh, I trust that uh, your heart has already been uh, stirred today to uh, just love the Lord more. And uh, that's really the uh, design of our worship services and just like the, the richness of the songs that we sing. And uh, whether that is um, from years and years and years and years ago in a uh, book where we could open up and have a hymn book, although it's up on the screen, or if it's a modern um, hymn, which was simply just rich in biblical doctrinal truth, and uh, I'm so thankful for uh, just these songs. Well, today we've got a uh, special afternoon plan. If you uh, would like to stay, we're going to be watching episodes five, six, seven, and eight, and I promise you they're the if you, did, if you loved the first four, the next four are absolutely incredible. And we've made some switches from uh, last week. You all were so gracious uh, as we kind of had technical difficulties throughout it. Uh, we have purchased the DVDs, so we will not have issues with the streaming of it. And then we also brought in our sound bar from the house, so it can just blast you with good audio. And everybody said... Amen. And well, we did our best and you all were gracious. And so uh, looking forward to a wonderful afternoon. Uh, we are, uh, it is kind of a picnic style lunch. And so uh, if you weren't prepared and you would uh, like to still participate, I'd be happy to purchase you lunch uh, and have that delivered in. But uh, we will probably spend about 20, 30 minutes or so uh, eating, and then we will get into uh, our uh, four episodes. And I'm excited uh, about that. And then on this coming Friday is the start of our twice a month uh, home group, and that's going to be at 6.30 p.m. at our home, and you have the address there, and then you can see the future dates through the month of October. So we'll start on the 3rd, then we'll have another one on the 17th, the 1st, and then October 22nd. And if you're wondering kind of what goes on at a home group, we do, uh, we have food together. Uh, it's not always uh, a full on meal, uh, but sometimes it is. But this first one, it, th th there'll be a lot of uh, good, yummy food for that. And so uh, just in, let's just enjoy uh, that, uh, that, that time together. And then we'll have a time of a form of a Bible study as well as questions and then a whole lot of fellowship. So it's going to be a great time September 3rd uh, from 630 and if you're looking for kind of uh, how late that will go uh, I would say till probably around uh, 8 or later. Sometimes people have stayed till 10 o'clock and that's totally 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 okay. Uh, but if you're kind of like the formalized setting of it from about 630 to eight. And uh, we'll have a good time. And then uh, this series that we're in right now is preparing our hearts for some ministry involvement uh, coming in the, uh, the end of October, but there'll be a luncheon on the third, but I am excited about that. That song that um, our group just taught us, they've been, they've been practicing it for um, several weeks, and it has been a tremendous um, it's been a tremendous blessing. It's been a tremendous blessing to our family even this week. Um, Tuesday night, Sarah and I found ourselves just before the Lord, just kind of weeping before the Lord. There were uh, some things kind of in our, in one of the ministries of our church is uh, CC. It's called Classical Conversations. It's a, it's a homeschool group that we have the privilege of hosting uh, here on our campus. And there was just some kind of turmoil that was going on with that, and it left us in a place of just uh, just brokenness before the Lord and weeping and crying out to Him. And we, as we were praying, I literally was praying some of the words of this song, and our hearts were just literally just laid out before the Lord that, God, this is your battle. You're going to have to go before us, and you're going to have to do the work. And it was amazing what He did by about 4 o'clock on Wednesday how he did go before us, and the battle belonged to him, and we laid it out. So I'm going to do an audible, Mike. Um, we're not going to sing that last song. Instead, we're going to sing that song one more time. And uh, as, as your pastor, don't decide, mm, do I like this song? Just like it and love it. It's biblical, and it's awesome. Let it minister to your heart. Okay, Mike. Thanks for, thanks for 
Thanks for letting me do an audible.
Matthew chapter number 13. And I've alluded to somewhat of a week of a little bit of struggle as well as a week of seeing God come mightily through. And uh, I, this, this week has been a week of probably more prayer than other weeks. And I don't take that as there aren't weeks that are full of prayer, but I think you know what I mean. There's just seasons, right? There's weeks of where you're bathing things over in prayer because of maybe what you're going through or maybe a decision that you need to make or whatever the case is. And so this, this text and this message has been just heavily prayed over, and it is my desire that uh, God would use it for His honor and for His glory. Last week we began with the uh, theme of expectations, and when you are considering a life that is going to be lived as a conduit, as a vessel that God can use, and you want to do that for a matter of a lifetime, we must start with proper expectations. And what happens in a life when, uh, when you're involved in an effort of sowing truth, sowing uh, just a, uh, a gospel-rich life over the course of your life? What, well, what happens? And so today we come to the second parable in which Jesus tells us a little bit more about the experience of the true Christian in this world. I've entitled this message, Limitations. Limitations. We're going to read just a few verses, and then we will kind of go through uh, a lot of this chapter. But just at the beginning here, verse number 24 of Matthew 13, another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. And so in the first parable last week, uh, the Lord spoke about four different kinds of soil. Now it is as if he kind of does a zoom in on the camera on the good soil. The other three, the path, the, the rocky ground, the, the thorns, the, they, they kind of drop out of sight for the rest of this chapter. And now we're looking at simply just the good soil. So I want you this morning to kind of picture, picture a field with all kinds of, you know, plowed, uh, beautiful lanes, and there's just straight lines. It's rich. It's dark soil. A lot of good seed has been placed into that soil. Now what happens when there's good seed placed into that good soil is you have an abundance of a crop, right? We looked at that even uh, last week, uh, some 30, 60, 100 fold. And so you have this beautiful, rich soil that is conducive for growth, and the proper seed has been placed into that, and the growth is taking place. But that's not the entire story. It's not the end of it. There's more to be said. And so we have this second parable in which Jesus focuses in on the experience of the good soil in this world. And so I want to I just spend some time here uh, this morning, and we're going to look at seven elements of this parable. Now, before you get nervous with that word seven, we'll be okay, I promise, all right? Let's look at uh, several, several elements of this parable. First of all, let's notice the owner. The owner. Verse number 24, Matthew 13. The owner. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. Right? So he's sowing that, sowing that good seed into his field. Now jump down to verse number 37. So Jesus kind of explains far more later in the chapter. He answered and said to them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. So the one who sows the good seed owns the field. It is, it is his field. Then we're told that this field, that it, that it is the world. So the sower of good seed is the owner of the whole world. 
Okay, so according to uh, Wayne Gruden in his book, Systematic Theology, he says that Jesus used this name, Son of Man, that he references here in this text, 84 times in the Gospels, and he always used it referring to himself. So he used it 84 times, and every single time that he said Son of Man, I remember talking to one of you men in here a couple, probably even a year ago, about the Son of Man and the Son of God. And so what are those terms? What's it like? And so he used it 84 times over the course of these Gospels, and he was always referring to himself. Jesus is described both as the Son of Man as well as the Son of God. That speaks volumes about who he is. He is God, and he is God. Man, the kind of theological term for that would be the hypostatic union. They're 100% God and 100% man. That's what the theologians would call that. So as God, he is the one with the Father, and yet he chose to become one with us in our humanity. The Word became flesh, John 1, 14 says. And all that God is, is found in in Jesus Christ. Now this title of the Son of Man, it comes from Daniel 7. And when you read it, which I'm going to read here for you in a moment, and you see the significance that, that, that Jesus, why Jesus took on this name as the one by which he most often would describe himself. Daniel 7 verse 13 says, I saw in the night visions and behold one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. So Jesus is saying, he said literally 84 times in the Gospels, he's saying, that is who I am. I am the one who is presented before the ancient of days. I am the one who has been given the kingdom and whom people from all nations and all languages will serve. And all of those kingdoms, and that kingdom will never pass away. So he says things that only God himself could ever say. Why? Because he is God. Jesus is God in the flesh. And what Jesus Christ is saying when he takes the title Son of Man, here's what he's saying. The whole world is mine. That's what Jesus is claiming when he says the Son of Man. Tying it back to Daniel chapter number 7. The whole world is mine. He claims sovereign rule over the entire planet, universe. Abraham Kuyper said, this is not, there is not a square inch in the whole dominion of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. Right? When we're teaching our little kids and their toddlers, mine, mine, mine. Jesus can literally say that. Mine. It's all mine. I mean, that's just mind-boggling that he just, it's literally all his. And then you read later in Colossians that it's literally all held together. It's all consisting through him. This is who this Jesus is. And he's the, he's the owner of this field. He, he lays claim not, of, not only to every life, but to every part of your life. Your mind, your heart, your will, your strength, your talent. Your energy. He lays claim to every stage of your life, your childhood, your teen years, your, your college years, your adult years, your, your middle age, middle life, retirement, old age, wherever you want to kind of say that you fit in on that. That's the owner. It's Jesus. But notice the enemy. This is odd. It's not odd, but it's just, look at verse 25. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. Jump down to verse 39. We're going to keep parallel in that. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. So the owner who is Christ 
He has an enemy, and you cannot understand the world in which we live as it is without taking into account the enemy and his work. Christ tells us that his enemy here in this text is the devil. If you do not believe in the devil, you need to remember that Christ does. If you think, ah, you know, that's just fairy tales, not real. No, no, no. Christ believes in him. He knew that his enemy well, and he was tempted by his enemy in the wilderness for, for 40 days. He came into the world to destroy the enemy, to destroy even the works of the enemy. 1 John 3, 8 says, For this purpose the Son of God was manifest, that he would destroy the works of the devil. Hebrews 2, verse 14. I love how this connects with even mankind and his incarnation. The author of Hebrews says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, just like we have skin, just like we have a body, he also, referring to Jesus, likewise took part in the same, that through death he would destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. So I want you to think with me for a moment. The power of his enemy, which we know is the devil, the power of his enemy is so great, the work of his enemy is so vast that it took God an incarnation, a cross, and a resurrection to defeat that power and to defeat him. Now we know that Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And we understand that beautiful New Testament principle that the Spirit of Christ, Holy Spirit living within us, is more powerful. We understand that. But you must understand that this enemy is real and that his working is mighty, in a sense, if you allow me to use that word, that God became incarnate, died on a cross, lived a perfect and sinless life, died on a cross, and then rose again with the keys to death and hell itself. And so the owner is Christ. The enemy is the devil. Now let's notice the seed. I told you we'd get through these seven quickly. Three, the seed. Look at verse number 38. So the field is the world... The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. So in the parable of the sower that we looked at last week, the seed was the word of God, and it was sown into the ground. But here Jesus kind of, he gives us a different picture. He's saying here in the second parable, the seed is people, right? People who are growing where they've been planted in the world. Okay, so just as there are two sowers, there are two kinds of seed. The different seeds are different kinds of people. The good seed is the children, the, 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 literally the sons of the kingdom. That is people who live under the rule of God in their lives. And then the other seeds that are sown, they're the sons of the evil one. They're the sons of the wicked one. And they're like those that place themselves on the throne of their own lives. So I want you to notice the destruction of the enemy's work here. He sows destructive seeds in Christ's field. He has no positive objection in mind. The motivating force of all of his work is simply to destroy the harvest. There's this pure maliciousness here that you are reading. The devil is a destroyer. Satan could literally go plant an entire field, all of his own, of all weeds, but that's not what he does. Instead, he's allowed by God to plant them within the good soil, within the sons of the kingdom, the children of the kingdom, those that are true believers. You have this evil work that's being done. He's trying to bring harm to what belongs to the sovereign Lord. Ronald Wallace says in his book, The Many Many Things in Parables, precisely where God has been most energetically at work and where the kingdom is most likely to advance, there the devil deliberately comes and concentrates his forces to prevent the spread of God's realm. This is one of the main reasons why so many evil things have marred the history 
of the church of Christ. This is becoming very well known that some of the fastest growing churches, the largest growing churches are taking place right now in the Middle East where they're, where they're just exploding of what's going on as there are converts and so much of it is underground and now you have the devil wreaking full havoc once again in that area. Understanding that he knows where he needs to fight because there are massive converts that are happening in the Middle East right now. The devil desires to bring shame upon the name of Christ. Therefore, he concentrates on the church. Have you ever scratched your head and said, <laughs> you know, over all of the terrible things that have happened to like the church of Jesus Christ, here's part of that answer is in this text. It's part of it. Let's notice the field. The field, according to our text, is the world. The field is the world. These words are crucial to understanding what this parable is actually about. Many have said that this parable is about the church, that there never can be a pure church, and they're certainly true this side of heaven, right? Because we exist in that church. Myself, yourself. Okay, but this parable is not in and of itself about that about the church. Yet there are certainly some applications of this parable for the church. One obvious application would be that the church should exercise great caution in its regard to maybe the Matthew 18 discipline. There are times when the leaders of the church must exercise discipline for the protection of the church. But surely this parable reminds us that it would be very unwise for leaders of a church to think that they could outroot, uproot every wicked thing that's inside a church because if we did that, we'd have nothing left, right? They'd be derooting themselves because we all are indeed sinners. Matthew Henry, in his commentary on the book of Matthew, says this, Great caution and moderation must be used in inflicting and continuing church condemnations, discipline, lest the wheat be trodden down, if not plucked up. Alexander McLaren in the Gospel of Matthew says, While we believe that the scope of the parable is wider than instruction in church discipline, we do not forget that a fair inference from it is that in actual churches there will ever be mingling of good and evil. Reason for copying the divine patience of the sower in ecclesiastical dealings with errors of opinions and faults of conduct. Because there is an intermingling. So there for sure is a lesson here for the church. Absolutely. But this parable in and of itself is not about the church. This parable is about the kingdom. Jesus begins by saying the kingdom of heaven may be compared to this. So this parable is about what the reign of God in the world looks like. So let me give you this phrase and just, just take it to heart. This is a picture of the church in the world, not the world in the church. Okay, you say, ah, oh, that's semantics. Actually, no, it's not. And it's going to flesh itself out over the course of the remainder of our message. So that leads us to the question of this parable. There's a question in it. Look at verse number 27. Jesus teaches in 24, 25, 26. And so then they're like, yeah, what? So the servants of the household come and said unto him, Sir, didst thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence hath it, then hath it tares? In other words, you sowed good seeds. Why are there weeds. What's going on? I mean, this is, remember, kind of zoom in on the camera. We're now in the, we're in the good soil. Good things are growing. God, Jesus, you sowed good seeds. Why are there now weeds? Can I put that into maybe today's realm of questioning? It would be like this. 
Here's what we would say today. We don't kind of talk like that. We're not necessarily all farmers. If any of us are, maybe some of you have a farm. It'd be great. If God is so good, if Christ is so mighty, like we've clearly sung about this morning, why is there so much evil in the world? That's how we would ask it today. So Jesus shares this parable, and they're coming, and they say, Hey, you, you're so good, you're so mighty, you're, you're, the, you're the son of man, you are all the things that Daniel 7 talks about, and why are there, why are there weeds? Why is there, well, what's going on? God, you're so good, you're so mighty, you're so awesome. Why is there so much evil in the world? This is a profound question. And it arises, honestly, in every single generation. Where does this evil come from? Why does it persist? If Jesus triumphed over evil on the cross, why is it flourishing today? You look at the weeds of evil in the world, and we are seeing them grow right now, aren't we? Every single day before our eyes, our hearts just break, our eyes tear up, and we cry out in prayer. For those of you that were in our, in our early morning Bible studies, we tried to articulate some ways that we can pray for our brothers and sisters and really just even non-believers that are in harm's way there in Afghanistan. But we wonder, why is it, why is it flourishing today? Is God really in control? Can I actually believe in a sovereign God in a world like this? If the kingdom has come, why does evil continue? Do you realize this is kind of what John the Baptist's question was? See, he was the forerunner of Jesus. He was preparing the way for Jesus. And as he was preparing that way, he would say things like this in Matthew 3, verse 12. Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. That was some of John the Baptist's message. You listen to him and you think, right, that's exactly, this, this, is what, this is what Jesus came to do. The Messiah is coming. He's going he's gonna to deal with evil. He's going to wipe it off of the face of the earth. And then a few years later, John's in prison. And John's like, I don't know. Can I just put it in? I, I don't know. I don't know who that guy is. I'm not trying to be irreverent. Can you, can you go ask him? Can you go ask him who he is? You begin to wonder, and so he sends a messenger. Matthew 11, 3 says, And said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Those of you that have been journeying through the chosen, you can kind of see this even in the lives of these people. They kind of had this perspective of what they thought Jesus was coming to do in that first coming. People assumed that when the kingdom came, that the Messiah would blow the whistle and it would be game over for all evil. But Jesus, my friend, came without judgment the first time. Isaiah says that the coming Messiah, that he's going to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance. That's what Isaiah said. Early on in Jesus' ministry, he got up and he read from this scroll, but he stopped prior to the day of vengeance. So what about that? What about this day of vengeance? Well, grace comes with Jesus now. Came with Jesus. We're living in that now. Judgment comes in his second return. He came in grace the first time. Came in love. But there's going to be eyes of fire. Right? Words that can literally devour people. That's coming. So, that's coming, Ryan. Well, then what's going to happen between, obviously, when Jesus came and he's ushered in this time of, of, uh, of grace and where people can receive this free gift of salvation and then the time of when he's going to come again and bring the wrath. So, what's going to happen? Well, let's look at verse number 30. We see that there's going to be growth. Let both grow together until the harvest. Both grow. Did you catch that? Look at it, verse number 30. Don't miss it. Let them 
both grow together until the harvest. My friends, evil is going to grow alongside the good until the return of Christ. It's the teaching of Jesus. And we need this wisdom if we are to sustain sustain a lifetime of service. Because we need to understand that the nature of the world is in which what we're living in. This, we've got to understand this. As we're trying to do good, as we're trying to be vessels, we've got the right expectations, right? We understand that there's all different types of soils, but now we're even in on the good stuff. And you've got to understand that there's going to be some even limitations, even in the good stuff, right? Even in the, even in the plowing, in that, in that rich, rich soil. The 20th century started with this extraordinary humanistic optimism. Charles Darwin, he captured, cap- captured the imagination of millions, right, when he published The Origin of Species. And the idea of that book was is that the human race, that it's evolving, right, that it was going to get better and better and better, and they were headed towards the golden age. Well, what happened in that golden age? Well, within 14 years of the turn of the century of the First World War, of the likes that this world had never even seen before. People said that this was going to be the war to end all wars, they said, right? But within 20 years, it started again. We weren't halfway through this great new century of us getting better and better, and things were going to become more and more glorious as we evolved and evolved and evolved. We had two world wars. The establishment of the United Nations meant that everything was going to be okay. But then the Cold War, the Cuban Missile Crisis, and so on. And as you get a little bit closer, kind of towards the end of that century, the Berlin Wall coming down. Yeah! Now's the time! And then you flip the page, and it seemingly, for our entire new century, has been the war on terror. And it's right before you again now. Every moment of every day with social media, it's just bombarding us now. So you look at the world's history, and you know that in every time evil gets pushed down, it tends to rise up again in another, maybe even more sinister way. The only people who should not be surprised are Christians. It doesn't mean that we don't let it shock us into where we, where we pray for these individuals and where we, um, where, where we just labor for them and fasting and praying and mourning for these types of things. But it really shouldn't, in a sense, surprise us that it's happening. J.C. Ryle and his The Expository Thoughts on the Gospel, he saw special importance to this parable in his own day. It says, It is eminently calculated to correct the extravagant expectations in which many Christians indulge as to the effect of missions abroad and preaching the gospel at home. See, if we start out with the aim, I'm going to change the world, do you see how that expectation earlier need to kind of, okay, all right, well, some, I'm, I'm going to try. It doesn't mean I'm not going to try, but mm, i got to be realistic with this. And then there's going to be even limitations within the good soil, limitations within the, 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 the primary just tools of the gospel. We're going to sustain a lifetime of ministry when we have a proper understanding. The world never officially changes, so to speak. It's always a field in which the wheat grows alongside the weeds, but there will be a harvest someday. There will be. It is through, it, it is worth planting the good seed because God will make it grow even in this troubled world. There's going to be a harvest of 30, 60, 100, right? We know that that is going to happen. Is this world getting better or getting worse? Both, right? It's getting better. Every convert, right? Every new disciple of Jesus, it's getting better. But then it's also getting worse. They're both going to grow together until the harvest. The world is getting better and it's getting worse at the same time. The good seed is growing, producing an abundant harvest. The grain on one stalk is much more than a little seed that was cast that very first time. And the weeds are growing too. 
With every week that passes, they are larger and more deeply rooted than they were before. And so Jesus says, this is a picture of what it's going to look like between then and later. This is what he said. Between when I came and when I come back again, this is what it's going to look like. It's going to look like a mixing. And we have application here coming in a moment. Ronald Wallace, again, once again in his book, The Many Things in Parables, says, Jesus Christ never taught that the movement of earth's history would take a form of a slow but steady development of the good upon this earth, accompanied by the gradual elimination of evil. He never taught that. He taught rather that the more the good developed, the more evil might also develop to ripen with the good. And so then that comes to our final observation of this parable before we apply it. The harvest. Look at verse number 30 again. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. So we're living in the day of God's grace. I kind of already mentioned that. The day of judgment has not yet come. And until that day, this is what the kingdom will look like. Good wheat in a field laced with weeds. It has become very popular, especially among younger Christians, to talk about bringing in the kingdom or setting things right in this world. It's important to remember that bringing in the kingdom means pulling up the weeds. <laughs> it means bringing, breaking up the great power structures of the evil of this world and the work of that judgment belongs to Christ. It doesn't mean that we don't, aren't vessels for, for right, that we aren't the salt and the light of the earth, that we aren't preservers of what is right. It doesn't mean that we don't try those things. But on the big grand scale, that day is going to come. And it's all going to get ripped up and the good is going to go into the barn and the bad is going to go into the fire. Let me give you a couple applications for us. Say, Ryan, we're kind of, we're kind of in a parable. It doesn't, doesn't, quite make, doesn't quite make sense. So stick with me for the next five minutes or so. Number one. Stay, you ready? Engaged. Stay engaged. Let both grow together. In this world, the wheat and the weeds, they're going to grow together. Christ, He anticipates that your roots as a believer, will be intertwined with the roots of people whose nature is very different than yours. That'll be true at school, maybe, business world, your neighborhood. You will find, even sometimes in your own family, that there are relationships that are very, very difficult. So let me ask you a question. Where has God rooted you? Where has he rooted you? Where have you been sown? And where you've been rooted and where you've been sown, stay engaged. Don't try to isolate. Don't try to, I'm not, I'm not like them. A few weeks ago, I had the opportunity to be with a couple of couples in our church, and we had some long car rides, and we're very like-minded on so many things, right? And I leaned over to Sarah at one point, and I liked those car rides, by the way, when you're like-minded, Right? And I told Sarah, I said, we need to get into places more often than we are where it's uncomfortable. Because I wasn't uncomfortable in that van. We thought 
very similarly when it comes to like the Middle East and politics and just it's like we thought a lot of the same and you know what it was it was a safe space and we need those and the body of believers oh we've got to have those why because we don't always get that in the world but I'm challenging you to stay engaged when you're out there you hearing me because you never know when a wheat or excuse me when a weed will become a wheat you never know you remember when you became a wheat? Remember that day? When you were, I was lost, but now I see. I was lost, but now I'm found. I was lost, but now Christ. And you never know when that will happen. Why? Because they both will grow together. Let both grow together, Jesus says there. I'm asking us to stay engaged. Sometimes we want to get so isolated in our stances that we take and we don't want no 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 I gotta I gotta I, I get that sometimes we fear for our kids and, and I understand all of that I'm not saying that we just you know just throw it all out there but just stay engaged stay engaged don't be on the agenda of a withdrawal from the world wherever Christ sows his people Satan sows his weeds. So bloom where you're planted. Bloom. Secondly, practice. Oh, you ready? Tolerance. We okay? We all right? I'm ready for the chosen too. I get it. I'm done too. See, the world, the world, excuse me. The word tolerance has been hijacked by our secular society. It used to mean showing patience and forbearance towards people with whom that you radically disagreed with. Now it's used to affirm people that you don't necessarily agree with, but to tolerate them, you have to affirm what they affirm. But there's no need for tolerance between two people who already affirm the exact same thing. And so they've twisted the word. Tolerance is a wonderful Christian virtue that is needed where there are deep, deep, deep seated disagreements. It means showing patience and forbearance towards people you find difficult. Showing grace and love and patience. Why? Because you know that, again, I'm trying to just apply this to us as believers, but like people are growing up with you and they, they, they I don't, might, might not be the tares, but just applying that they're different. They think differently. And we're kind and we're compassionate and we are loving, even with people that we radically disagree with. That doesn't mean passivity. Doesn't mean that we don't speak truth into those people's lives, but we've got to be in those people's lives to speak truth into those lives. You, you, you following me? Where if we have fully just alienated ourselves and we've not stayed engaged, and where we've just tried to isolate, you know, me too, one, one two, three, me, and this is it, this is all us, this is the people that I like. I mean, you need some of that in your life. I've already reiterated that. Safe spaces. It's a politically correct term right now. Always remember the mission of the church is sowing seeds, not pulling weeds. We have a big enough challenge on our own hands trying to deal with sin in our own hearts, our own failures, in our own church, and to worry about any other church. It's not in our power or in our calling to root it out of the world. No, we're to let both grow until the harvest. And the only way we're going to let both of them grow is by staying engaged and by tolerating because you're anticipating the harvest. Verse 43, Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. There is coming a day where there'll be a harvest. So Ryan, why'd you kind of start this series the way that you did? Well, because the parables kind of laid this out for us. But if we're going to have sustaining service, 
If we're going to be like, all right, I'm a conduit that I want God to use in whatever capacity he's gifted me for a lifetime, then we're going to have to have the proper expectations. And we're going to have to understand that there's limitations even as we are living out for God. But there's coming a day when there's a harvest. Might not always see it right now. Might not be able to kind of navigate through things and say, yep, all right, that's where growth is. Because why? Sometimes it takes time. And the ultimate explosive harvest and growth, that's going to, it all belongs to the Lord anyways. Why? Because he's the sower and, he's the, and it's his field. But it's going to be towards the end where we're going to see, ah, that's why. That's why. So my prayer is that application for us would be, let's stay engaged at that workplace. Ryan, you don't know where I work. Stay engaged with those people. Love them. Show them what true compassion and grace looks like as we are tolerant, gracious, kind, patient, forbearing with people that greatly disagree with the way that we live and function. Because God is using all of it for his honor and for his glory. Every head bowed, every eye closed.